some junk out of the way. Back to our bucket. When our bucket is done, I think we'll move on to something else. Let's get going. Good morning, good morning. Before I touch this, which way is the zoom? Let me think about this. When you stand there with the camera and looking the normal way, you pull your finger as a right-handed person, it zooms. So for me, I should push the zoom. I'm terrified of this. Push the zoom. Have I got this? Have I got this? At last, have I got this? Well, good morning, gang. Hello, hello, hello. Same time, same place, same station, same work. It's going to be quite a while on this block, of course, with only a couple of hours, an hour's work a day on it. It's going to take a long time, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay, before I forget, a couple of things. One, the paper is out. Thank you very much. Three packages are out today. Sugisan's test printing uh, JJ2. Uh, Ishikawa-san is doing her real printing on JJ2, and Kawai-san is, no, Dei-chan. Dei-chan is working on some more New Year prints still. We don't have enough. We're still short. This month and next month, Patreon's people are getting uh, New Year prints still. Papers out. Thank you very much. Three packages, yes. And we have a show-and-tell today. Not a, not a dramatic show-and-tell. It's kind of a quiet one. Something I found yesterday when we were uh, packing some prints. I thought, oh, that looks interesting. So uh, remind me, if it gets to be about 9 o'clock or so and I haven't remembered by then, remind me there's a show and tell today. Today is Sunday. I'll be by myself here. Cameron won't be in. He's off always on Sundays. So the wheel should be disturbed by the staff arriving here at around 9.20 in an hour and a half from now. might not be a bad idea you know <laughs> let me think about that a little status sticker paper is out yes yes yeah yeah in fact I'll forget this can you can you send a send a question about that please we've got our question box here this is our question box could you do me a favor that same comment you just made right now please send it to me as a question in the twitch question box and I will try and implement that that would be a great idea paper status out But then if you don't see it, well, it means I've forgotten, doesn't it? Okay, anyway, good, good. <laughs> my life revolves around my refrigerator duties every morning. <laughs> but actually, it's so important to the printer, you know. If I do forget to take that out, that's already cut. Actually, when I went up there this morning, I found that the Ishikawa-san yesterday, she kind of cheated with the refrigerator, with the freezer. She was here late last night. She was the last one out, probably around 9.30 or something. And I see on the schedule board that she's going to be here this morning early. So what she did was she didn't even put her paper in the freezer. Uh, the, the back room there, you've seen it when we do sizing in the morning. The temperature is about 10 degrees or so. So she just put two and two together. She's leaving at 9.30, coming in at 8 or something, 9 o'clock. So there's no need to put that one in the freezer. It's just as staying outside. There's no difference. So when I went up there this morning, her paper was just sitting on the counter already. I didn't need to take it out.
You guys are quiet this morning. It's good, whatever. <laughs> Yesterday we had a peaceful day in the shop here. It, uh, you know, we're really never sure what to expect any given day. It could just be all day busy or, or quite all day quiet. Our things have slowed down a bit now after the TV. We were on TV, a Sunday morning program. I guess it was two weeks ago. Was it three weeks ago? I don't remember. And after that program, then the weekends were quite busy for us with Japanese people, which they are not normally. But I think that's pretty much quieted down now. And as far as the tourists go, the weekends or weekdays don't really make a whole lot of difference. People don't really keep track of even what day it is when they're, when they're on holiday, you know. So for us, a Sunday is no different than any other day, really, in that sense. So, so we never know. It can be a quiet day. It can be a busy day. There's a couple of party reservations this afternoon. There isn't one for this morning. And yesterday, the three of us, there's three of us here on staff, and we had a really nice quiet day. We got lots of packing done. In fact, that's related to the, uh, to the show and tell. It's going to come up in a few minutes here this morning. We caught up on a lot of packing. We've got a bunch of uh, Edo and Meiji era prints here. And we've, uh, we've got literally hundreds and hundreds of them here, but they're just sitting in storage boxes because we haven't had time to get them packed. And so the three of us yesterday spent hours and hours and hours, and we got hundreds of new prints into the shop. I mean, Edo era, late Edo, early Meiji landscape prints. And we got dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of them into the shop because we had uh, time to work on that. And also, I'm not, uh, not sort of teasing you about that, because we've also got uh, a new young lady coming, uh, Kira-san, you met her a couple of times already. And she's going to be, one of her main jobs for the next couple of weeks is going to be scanning and uploading new flea market prints. So a lot of those Edo era prints and major era prints will be up on the website within the next, uh, next couple of weeks. She'll be working on that pretty much all day Monday, scanning one by one, bang, 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 uploading. Part of the focus here on getting these older prints into the shop, part of this is just a general interest in expanding our business and finding nice items for people and getting the world of woodblock prints a bit wider. But part of it is also kind of a protection defense for me. You know? Our printers already are working, you know, as, as producing as many prints as they can. I can't ask Sugasan, san and the girls to say, okay, hey girls, make twice as many prints this month as you did last month. They can't do that. And yet, because of the success of the JJ series, uh, they, they're basically being put in that position. And the problem for me is that the time they're going to spend making those subscription prints is time that they can no longer spend producing some of the other prints in our shop. So I'm looking at a situation where come March and April, I will be very much out of stock on a lot of the standard prints in our catalog. And even some of the Heroes prints, we're going to have trouble getting enough time to reprint them. So because of that, if I don't do something, uh, we will have a situation where people will be coming into the shop in the springtime. And, you know, like there'd be nothing here for them. So although I can't increase our print production, just by turning on a tap. I can increase our print inventory, including old prints, by spending more money and buying a whole bunch more. And that's what I've been doing, you know, since, uh, since this thing has become, uh, has become changed. You know, I am buying many more older prints, expanding our selection of that sort of stuff. Okay, I think this bucket is pretty cleanly outlined. Let's leave the bucket for now and then move on to another area. Let's work our way across the image. I'm fine. I'm, I'm quite 
You know, I was down for a day or two, not so well, but I'm fine. Nothing systemic, of course. I was just kind of tired, tired, tired. No matter how much gumpy paper you pull off these things, there's always room for picking off more. I thought about disappearing for a month to test the resilience of the shop. I got a 10 day break coming up. I'm going to visit my family in Canada in February. I'm leaving on February 12th. I'll be away for 10 days. And already some of the people here, like Ishka Sam last night before she left, she came and said, Dave, let's have a meeting. I'm like, well, what do you mean? She says, no, I gotta sit and talk. We have something very important to talk about. And I'm like, okay, okay. I thought she's like, no, don't tell me you're pregnant or something or whatever. No, she says, no, no, you're leaving. For 10 days, right? He said, what are we going to do? <laughs> I'm semi-laughing, but what she was trying to emphasize was she really wanted to make sure that before I took off on that little family vacation, that she had enough paper ready, that the sizing was done, that the color separations on JJ4 were ready, and stuff like that. She was just making sure that I was on this. And I, yeah, I'm Ishkalsan, I am on this. I am thinking about such things, of course. I mean, we're still in that situation. It's a transition from a one-man business to a job, a business where many people do the jobs. And it's, a, it's not a single, easy, smooth transition. We stagger forward, stagger back. I'm trying to delegate as much of my work as I can, but still, a lot of it is just simply on my shoulders. And that's all there is to it. But she, anyway, she wanted to express her concern to make sure that she didn't end up being in a difficult situation while I was away. Part of it too is she wants to make sure that decisions have been made because she doesn't want to be put in a situation where she has to make decisions. And if I'm not here, who's going to decide whether it's a dark blue or a light blue or something? And she's terrified of making decisions. Most of the people here are. So that's the number one concern for her, that I didn't leave a decision undone. That's life. That's the way it is. Oh, this is a bit of a hard piece. This boxwood does have harder spots. Who's going to take the paper out of the freezer? That's a good question, and they're just going to have to work it out. And I'll, I think probably what they're going to do is, and I'll, the ones who are coming the next day, for example, if Suicide's working on Tuesday and coming on Wednesday, this is February. It'll be February while this is happening. The back room is really cold. What they'll be doing is just leaving their paper out. And I'll, we've got into the habit over the past few years now, our paper goes into the freezer every night, whether it needs it or not. And really sometimes it actually doesn't need it. If you're doing a job of 100 sheets and they've got 50 colors for each sheet, it's gonna take two weeks and you're doing this in August, then yeah, you're gonna be really, really careful about the mold. If you're doing a job that's only 50 sheets and six colors and it's gonna be finished in four days and it's February, you know, you really, honestly speaking, don't need to put it in the freezer in the first place. We've just got in the habit of doing it as a, as I said, it's become a, a total standard routine for all of our paper. 
I'm, I'm going to take some days off in February where it's the best possible time for doing this. So almost certain what they're going to do is they're going to leave their paper out on the table in the back room where it's really, really cold. And none of them have jobs right now that are really extended jobs that are taking months and months to do. So there's going to be no danger of, uh, of mold. If we were doing this in the middle of August, we'd have to work out plan B. Somebody else would have to take the paper out of the freezer. Thank <laughs> you. Well, the staff does make their own prints, you know. Pretty much all the people here who are working at the production side of things do have their own printmaking. Uh, some of you know about Shiba-san's prints you've seen. They're actually in our catalog. We've got another print in the catalog here made by our young printer, Dei-chan. She and her, her partner, Chong-san, who's our carver, they make their own prints. So they're doing their own stuff. We've got some of theirs in the shop. They work at night in their spare time making their own prints. Who else? Ishikasa makes her own prints as a hobby. She pr produced, actually, over the past couple of years, she's produced two woodblock printed books, multi-page books, with a woodblock carved and printed cover and woodblock carved and printed pages. Uh, private, sort of private publishing. It's a theme. She just has done a, a woodblock printed book 
talking about her dog, her pet dog. The dog has a character and it appears there and it talks in the book. And she's taken the time and the trouble to carve a full set of plates for every page of a woodblock printed book and then make it. And she's done this in her own her free time at home. Sugasa, I think, doesn't do any printmaking by herself at home. But pretty much everybody else here who is working as production staff is also working on their own press, and they're doing fine with it. So they're actually quite confident of their own, uh, own abilities, especially you know, Shiba-san. Shiba-san now must be one of the best-selling independent printmakers in the country, I think. You know. Because she's got uh, the, the venue here, the sales venue here for putting it into the market. You know. This wood is nice. I'm so happy that we got this. I tried to do this. So nice. I remember now what it's like to carve on a nice piece of wood, you know. It's been so long since I've done this. Look at this. The lines are straight. They're smooth. It's a nice mountain on each side. They're going to print so nicely and cleanly. A block like this will last such a long time because it's so hard wood. I was zoomed out, soka soka. Sorry about that. I... Sorry about that. I... Speak up, Nate. Eh? The dog book has two volumes now, right? I don't. I didn't really follow it very well. She doesn't tell me about any of that stuff, you know. She sort of says, "Oh, I'm embarrassed to show it to you," so she won't tell me about those things. I have to hear about it from other people. Will I carve fingernails on the boys? Somebody's asking if they're there. I see one fingernail here. Those rest are hidden. What they have more than fingernails is toenails. This boy has full toenails. One, two, three, four, might be five. So yeah, we'll carve them when we get to them. Toenails. One, two, three, four, yeah. I'm going to carve what I see. And we're not drawing anything here. It's my job to, to carve what I see in the picture.
some of these lines here are actually not very sharp and clear for me to see because I sort of cheated on this preparation. Not cheated, I shortcut it. I took the woodblock print that we're reproducing. I scanned it at, uh, what was it, 1200 dpi. Then I didn't do what we did, for example, with the octopus print or the great wave print, where I then traced myself in Photoshop. I then traced carefully every single line, removing the colors, leaving just the lines for a key block. I didn't do that this time. The print I had was done in fairly light colors, and the key lines seemed fairly clear. So I brought it in Photoshop and played with the levels and hue and saturation and stuff like that. I tried to take out the color backgrounds and leave just the lines. And I did that. So this is not something that's been traced by me. This is simply an output from Photoshop. In some places, it left the lines fairly visible. And in some places where the lines were really, really you know, faint, like it's in those toenails, it's left them a little bit less visible. So I'm going to have to sort of scramble a bit to maybe make up a little bit when I'm doing it. I'll keep the original print nearby when I'm doing those parts, refer to it, and just sort of carve them as I go along. I didn't really think this job was worth spending a couple of weeks tracing it first before then starting to carve. A major production like the octopus and the great wave, I really wanted to make them identical, as close as I could to the original, as in an identical reproduction. So I took the trouble to really trace and shape and get the character of every single dot and every line on the print for the octopus in a great way, because they were, quote, reproductions, unquote. This project is not. This project is Dave making a print based on an old print to, to fill his series here. It's not intended to be a classical reproduction, every dot, every line. So as I'm carving this now, even, I'm not absolutely something that was in the bucket, in, the, in those ropes on the bucket. I didn't try and reproduce the original ropes. I tried to add actually a little bit more character because they had missed a bit of it when they were doing it. So the sort of, can I say it, the philosophical concept behind this print I'm making today here is a little bit different. This is not an absolute perfect line for line, dot for dot reproduction. So I didn't trace it all first. I'm semi-making it up as I go along. Of course, 99% staying on the lines. There's no more fatiguing to carbon boxwood. It's clear, it's smooth and easy. You know, I broke the knife the other day because I just wasn't sure about the resistance level that was in there, you know. No, no, this is easy, clean work. Someone's asking, what about the dirt on the clothes? That's left over from the color blocks. That's gonna be a color pattern. That's a, these, these dirty things on, where am I here? These dirty things on clothes. These are what the Photoshop didn't pull out of the color patterns left over. We'll do those later on the color blocks. At the moment, I'm just simply pulling out the key blocks. Now we're limited with boxwood, the size of the blocks. There's just a limit. The trees just don't grow physically large. They get old and old and old, and they. it's not a question of developing massive trunks. Boxwood trees are very small. They're stunted, they're short. They bush out, but they don't grow large trunks. That's just the nature of the species. So John San and I were talking about this just last night, you know, about this. The fact that we can use boxwood for small prints like this, but what about the Ukiwa Hero series and stuff like that? So we were thinking about other alternatives we haven't ever tried yet. And people who are doing wood engraving, engrail engraving, I've used boxwood for many, many years, and they're not bothered by the size because they, they uh, what, do, what, do, what do I say, they, they make bigger blocks out of smaller ones. 
they patch together chunks of small pieces and make bigger ones. And when you're on the end grain, you can get away with that. But on a plank, you can't, because the planks warp, and you end up with a different um, feel and tone in different parts of the wood. But we were thinking about what other different kinds of trees. And in the engraving world, it's quite common to use other fruit woods. Apple, pear, stuff like this. Pear, pear uh, was used in the engraving days. Pear wood apparently is hard and dense, similar to boxwood. Again, we're talking about end grain engraving, not carving on the plank. But then the thought came up was, yeah, if it's fruit trees that in general have hard, dense grain, what about apple? How would that be for carving? Because you can get apple trees with a big fat trunk. You know, I've seen in my own, in my own experience, we have an apple tree in the backyard. And it was a big fat tree. So I wonder if that's something that's worth investigating. And a cherry, that's one reason why cherry must be used. Cherries actually relate to that, right? It's a fruit tree. So maybe this is another avenue worth exploring. Maybe apple would produce a decent size board useful for wood cutting. Hmm. Ooh, that came out nicely. There she goes. Let's do it again.
Okay, questions, questions. How often do I sharpen the blade? You'll see in a few minutes. I'll be sharpening in a few minutes. On, a, on tight wood like this, I sharpen, I don't know, every hour or so. More if it chips and pops. You'll see it soon. I think I'll probably touch up the blade probably once today. Why is the wood ply? Why is the wood so thick? It's for stable stability. You know, we have a top layer of, you can't see it because it's tape on the edge. We have a top thin layer of boxwood. It's about three millimeters thick. It's thinner than our normal cherry wood. Boxwood is so strong that if we have a five, six millimeter layer on top, it'll tend to pop up. So we keep a top layer very thin and the plywood core gives stability to the block. What was that line you carved about one millimeter away? Okay, okay, that's mudabori, mudabori. Ano. We've talked about this before. Ano. How can I, do I have a sample here now? Tick, 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 tick. Let's try it here. Let's look at one of these. Okay, just this line here. There's one line I want to carve here. When I'm using my knife in here, the knife itself has two sides. It's got a flat side there, and it's got a beveled side here. And the way I'm going into the wood, it's at an angle, and the flat side is against the part of the wood that's going to be retained. And the beveled side is against the part of the wood that's going to eventually be taken away. So this is, I, mean, I am answering your question, but a step, step at a time. So the point being here, I'm not sure if you can see it, but the stress on the wood is all on this area, not this area. And there is stress because we're pushing a chunk of steel down into a piece of wood, which was a solid piece of wood, but now there's a chunk of steel in the middle of it. So wood has been squeezed. And I don't want this side squeezed, the line. I want this side squeezed, the part that will be waste. It's okay, no problem. Step one, we've done that. Here's now the wood that's been squeezed and damaged. This piece of wood is coming away as part of the waste. So the squeezed, damaged wood is now gone. 
the wood that wasn't squeezed, that was against the flat side of the knife, is there. Now, when I want to carve the other side, if I just come around here like this now and do the same thing again, I'm at a bit of a handicap because something is different. The part of the wood that is going to be left, that line, no longer has any backup. It's thin and it's all by itself. And if I just put my knife in here and start cutting, I can keep most of the squeeze on this side, but inevitably some of the squeeze and stretch stress will now go onto that thin piece because it has no backup. So what's commonly done is this. We put another line in. This is called mudabori, waste, no, stebori, throw away, throw away carving. Come in, mudabori is something else, I'm sorry. This is stebori, throw away carving. We're cutting a line in the junk wood that will be thrown away. This is a completely wasted effort, it seems like. But what it does is that when I now come to carve this line, as I carve down here, the waste side now can easily, easily move out of the way because of that relief cut. And this means even less pressure goes on the wood that's going to be retained, that line behind me. You can see it's starting to move already. So this is an extra way to reduce pressure on the wood that is going to be retained. So almost all the stress from this V steel being pushed into the wood, all the stress now, almost all of it, is going on the outside of the line, the part that's going to be thrown away. Put it in a corner. Pop it out as always. And now this junk wood, actually, now it may be, fin it's not quite carved enough to be removed. We can do that now. Here it is, you can see it. it's mostly free. And if I did that correctly, actually I screwed it up a little bit, it's not quite so straight. But if I did that correctly now, this piece of wood that has been left has had very little stress applied to it. It's a sort of a mountain shape, you know, it's, it's got slope on both sides. And if I've been good at this, it hasn't been stressed at all. All the stress went out into this area and this area. Why is this important? Well, if I, if I had put stress on that wood, if I had squeezed it, it would then be squeezed now. And it would look pretty nice. It would look like a fine line squeezed, very thin. But with squeezed wood like that, when you come later on to do your printing, you put water on the block, water-based pigments to, to print it, that line drinks that water, expands like crazy, and you get way, way fat lines all over the block when you really thought you had carved nice thin lines. I fell into this for years before I understood how to use the knife properly. Most of the prints I carved in that poet series were carved the wrong way around. I put the bevel against the line because that's the way I was told to do, ha, incorrectly. And I didn't know about stiboy throwaway carving. So my poet's blocks were hugely trouble for me. I'd start printing, the lines would expand, I'd have to get back under the carving and thin them down, which was difficult. Anyway, as usual, long answer to a simple question, sorry. And I had the wrong Japanese term, it's not mudaboi, waste carving, it's steboi, throwaway carving, sorry about that.
There's a knot. Hey, this is a knot in the block. We tried to avoid it when I was pasting down. This was the key one, this knot. I had to make sure it didn't fall on this line when I was pasting down the, the design. But there's one here. Not in a good place, but uh, it's also really easy to break your knife at such a place. Look at this. Do you notice also to the angle of the blade here? I know I don't mean the angle this way. I mean the angle this way. When we, when I came around that corner, for example, my blade here is to me almost straight up and down into the wood because I've got to go around the corner. I don't want too much metal in the wood. But when I was carving that line here a minute ago, now I'm carving this line. The knife now isn't standing straight up. I tilt it down, 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 down. You see what it's doing? That's putting more metal into the wood at any one given moment. There's, you know, two or three millimeters of, of the blade in the wood, and that helps keep on a straight line. It's difficult to curve this way and that way when your knife is down like this into the wood. So you see me switching back and forth. I don't even really think about it when I'm doing it, but anytime there's a straight line like this, down goes the angle. And now as I get close to the end, I've got to stand it up again, ready, ready, up we go, standing up, standing up, standing up, standing up, right to the tip, and away we go. A short piece like this, of course, the knife is now standing up, I'm coming right down from a vertical angle into the thing, and back again on the other side now, I'll start by standing up, take the tip off, and now lay it down again, and try and put as much blade into the wood as possible. It's jerking here because it's hardened. It's in this. Is that knot? Where is it? Here it is. The guy who did the original here didn't use a ruler. This line is not straight, it flexes and flows a bit. We're just following.
石川さん、ハローグッドモーニング、そっかそっか。Conversation, conversation. The knot's a problem. If it breaks, I gotta cut it out and plug it, but I'm not about to start plugging if I don't need to. <clears throat> Anytime we're plugging, there's the, there's the risk that the plug will over time not match. You know, We don't want to start plugging a block. Way too many I haven't seen the conversation. I'm sorry. I'm missing stuff all over the place. Cross grain is easy. The cross grain, I tell you, cross grain. And、um, when I was a beginner here, I was thinking you make a cut with the grain. Where's an example? I don't have one, so I can't.、Uh, let's see. Whatever. If you hear, the wood grain is running this way here. There's the wood grain on this block. It's this way. And when we've got a line that runs across the grain, my pen won't draw. The pin won't draw on the comic paper. The grind across the grain and with the grain, totally. When you're running with the grain, I suppose this is the line I'm carving. The biggest difficult part is when you're running with the grain, your knife tends to try and follow the grain lines. Your knife doesn't want to follow the actual carved line, your knife wants to follow the grain lines. So it's really, really difficult. You can't dig into the block, you have to scratch just the very surface of it. The line you want. If you dig into the block, your knife will really tend to follow the grain lines. So, for, for accuracy, with the grain is really difficult. Across the grain, for accuracy, just it's really no problem because there's no grain to follow. Your knife just follows the line that you drew. So, accuracy is much easier across the grain. What's not so easy is when you're now cutting the back side, when we've done what we showed a minute ago. When we had one line carved, and it comes time to carve the back side. If it's with the grain, this line is fairly strong and smooth because it's wood that goes with the grain and it's difficult to chip and pop. If you've got a line like these, these you know, water strokes, these are across the grain. And if I'm not careful, if I push my knife in too far, stress them too much, pop, you will get a piece that pops out against the grain. So, you have to be really careful both ways for different reasons. Carving with the grain, you have to be really careful about accuracy, but the lines don't split. Carving across the grain, accuracy is really easy, but if you're not careful, the lines will pop and split. We much, I, we, whatever, I, I much prefer carving across the grain, because that's part that you can control easily. You can control your depth, you can control the stress, you can control what's going on, and you usually end up with a beautiful, Beautiful clean line exactly where you wanted it to be with the grain lines. You saw me actually when I was doing this, it didn't come out exactly the way I wanted. I had to go back, I trimmed it a little bit because it wasn't right the right thickness because the knife hadn't gone where I wanted it to go. The knife followed the pressure of the wood grain. You didn't see me trim these at all, I didn't have to, but you did see me trim that with the grain line. Different problems.
dangerous place here now. Oh, this is rock hard here. I can't believe I'm going to get through this without trouble. And I have to skate over this part like it didn't even, like it's ice. Cut, 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 slide. It just slides over this part. Just slides around. There's normal. What's our time? Oh, 9.07. Show and tell, show and tell. Show. Let me get this little strip out. I forgot about that. Hi, hi, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Next tonight for the more acute bevel. No, an acute bevel would break in an instant. Really rock hard wood like that. I want less acute because an acute bevel will just snap off. Absolutely. Get this strip out quick. Yeah, <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, let's zoom out a bit. Okay, what we were doing yesterday, as I said, we were packing a bunch of I know, Edo era prints. We got a whole bunch, hundreds, literally, a stack about this deep of Edo era prints over the past few weeks. And we've been bit by bit by bit getting them sorted out and inventoried and cataloged and put into the shop. And yesterday, a bunch of the ones I was putting into the shop, where's the example I had here? Among the prints we were putting into the shop was this one. Now it's a bit silly to ask you, but do you remember this? You've seen this somewhere before. What this is, is this is you know, somebody working with the name Hiroshige. Almost certainly it's not the person we know as the famous Hiroshige. Going by the date and the general provenance of these series, the researchers and stuff who have talked about this. This series apparently is 1862. And this is the person that has taken the name Hiroshige, the one that's generally called Hiroshige II. I don't know much about the, the uh, history of the artists and the studios and whatever. It's, you know, Hiroshige, the famous designer, had apprentices and deshi and whatever, and somebody, when he was getting too old, somebody took the name and ran with it and went with it. And the publishers were fine. The prints looked pretty much the same. There's no prints left under this name, Hiroshige II or three that really are wonderful masterpieces. They're pretty much very standard issue. If I said hack work, that's a bit of an insult. They're just very standard, commonplace drawings. Nothing really special about them. Some can be very nice. This one's very nice. But the niceness mostly comes from the, the attractiveness of being a woodblock print with the paper and the washi and pigments. Anyway, this design, you haven't seen this print before because this is new to me, but this design you have seen before. This is from the series of 68 views of, or views of the 68 provinces. And this is a place called uh, 
um, Aki. And to put to put the you know to put the you know, mystery gone, a few months ago we got a package from Harada-san, the old carver who died, who left me his bench, or whose son gave me the bench. Harada-san, the old carver. We received a package of various loose printings and blocks and random stuff left over from the old carver Harada, who died in the 1960s. And when I was cleaning that stuff up and putting it into folders, we found various test prints and proofs and different things that were going on. And among that package, was something that I pulled out and I showed you at the time because it was really interesting. Hang on, where are we? It's in here somewhere. I thought it was near the front, so I'm sure it's in here somewhere. Here it is, here it is, here it is. Here it is. There were two sheets of paper in here. There was this design, which looked really, really something funny. It's the key block. It's a test print. This is still in production. And in the sky, there's a funny line carved, and there's a dark sky, which would not be on the key block. And in the river, the same thing. There are a couple of boats carved here, and there's a bunch of funny black blobs carved. And what is this? It seemed to be a mystery at first, but what this is was, this was part way through a process when the key block was being carved before they had carved the color blocks. They needed to know when they carved the color blocks for the river, the blue river and the clear sky, they needed to know where the snowflakes needed to go. So they had been drawn on the tracing and the carver of the key block made sure that we were able to see where the snowflakes could go, even though they wouldn't be appearing on the key block. So he put, he left temporarily, he left wood in the river area, carved snowflakes in it, and in the places where he needed key lines, he couldn't do that, so he just left a tiny blob of wood, carved a snowflake in it. Now, once the color block transfer had been made, those things would then be removed from the key block, and that's what we also have in Harada San's folder. So, this is the finished key block, an impression from the finished key block, ready to make the print. And by the time it got to this stage, there would have now been a color block for the river with snow carved out of it. Also down here, dot, 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 those dots that we had here, showing where the snow was. And there would also have been a block for the sky carved with only dot, 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 dots showing snow. And once those color blocks were carved, he had then come back to the key block and ripped away those temporary areas. So we have key block at stage one, where the lines are carved, and enough information for color transfers here. And then we have stage two, the color blocks now exist, and he can come back and clean away the key blocks. Anyway, point being, what we have now found is, we have now the original Edo era print that this whole thing was copied from. Now they made their reproduction at a slightly smaller size. You can see what's happening here. This is the Edo original, and this is an original Edo era, uh, 1862, this is still Edo. Edo ended in, Wikipedia please, 1868, is that when Meiji started? Yeah, 1868, yeah, because last year was 150 years. So this is an original Edo era print from which this reproduction was made. Now they didn't do it at exactly identical size. For some reason they were making a series of prints at a slightly smaller size. So anyway, this was gonna go into the shop yesterday and I was seeing this and I thought, wait a minute, I've seen that picture before. So I think I'm not gonna put this in the shop. I am gonna steal it myself and keep it in my own little collection here, because this will make a great story at some point when we've got our little exhibition space upstairs to explain how prints are made. So we're gonna keep this one. Then when I was going through the pack, the girls had been packing these, and I, once I saw this one, I thought I'm gonna keep this. I looked through the deck to see what else might be interesting, and something else came up. This is the same series, 68 views of the various provinces of Japan. And when I saw this, I thought, oh, look at how much fun this is. And this is interesting. It's a random, just normal view of a landscape. This is 1862, this is Edo. And look what we've got here. We've got a landscape with different depths, stuff in the distance, stuff in the foreground. We've got shading, shadows, on the different landscape items, not something that was really popular, common in the Edo time. We have, look at this, 
gradation on the mountains, gradation on the back, and we have, extremely unusual for this period, we have a clean, flat rain block applied over everything, the top of everything, in thin lines. Where have you seen this stuff before? This is, I mean, they didn't have the word Shinhanka back then, but this is the kind of stuff that clearly is the rudimentary beginnings of what became the Shinhanga in the 1920s and 30s. That stuff didn't just pop out of nowhere. The rudiments of it, the basic fundamental pieces of the puzzle were all there. Distant landscape, gradations on the hills, atmospheric rain, soft colors. I'm not gonna call this one Shinhanga because that's not what it is and they weren't even thinking of such a thing. But this is a real kind of, for me, it's a kind of a link. And again, when we're building our exhibition space upstairs in the next year or so, as we're preparing the exhibitions to talk about prints from our collection, there are going to be all kinds of stories that we're going to find. I mean, every print has lots of stories. Try not to internationally broadcast embezzlement. Embezzlement, what are we doing? I said I stole it. I'll pay for it, of course. <laughs> I said I stole, I mean, I, I stole it from the shop. You can't buy it because I'm going to keep it back for myself is what I'm saying. These things are all mine, actually. You know, they're all mine. We bought these prints. This stuff actually technically is mine already. You know? I have more prints than I even know about. Yeah, yeah, Bokashi, Bokashi. We're not just talking about Bokashi. We're talking about how it's used to show the shape of the landscape items. Bokashi existed from about 1790. I'm, I'm not, whatever, explaining and telling the whole full story here. What can I say? I'm talking about the way it's used to make a particular feeling of depth of landscape. The main Hiroshige used, used Bokashi all the time, of course. Every print in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s had Bokashi. Anyway, whatever. We'll keep this aside, and later on we'll analyze it, we'll look at it carefully, and we're going to show a series of prints A, B, C, D, E, of which this will become part of a stream, showing how the 20th century prints came to life. What's that noise? Kawaii-san is here. Hey, let's just do a bit more carving and get ready and finish off and get this shop open. I'm going to finish off this little tablet here. The company is a proprietorship. We don't have a company. This is not a company. The whole organization here is a proprietorship. In Japanese, it's called Kojin Jigyo. So everything that sits here, this desk is mine, this bottle is mine. I'm talking about the, from the point of legal point of view. When somebody buys a print here this morning, the income from that print sale is considered by the tax office as my personal income. And I have to pay tax on it. Of course, I have expenses too, staff expenses, buying prints, you know, whatever expenses. It's a joke, Dave. Yeah, whatever. I don't know. I'm, I'm reading one in ten of these lines, so. Okay, let's get busy on this here. Finish off with a little bit of real work.
Quite some good morning. Hello. You can say hello here. It's Kawaii San again this morning. He and I. Who's else? Nakamura San is here today as well. Ah, so it's Nakamura San to Mobu desu. The party is go go. Ja, kantan desu ne. Good, good. Should have an easy day today. So, so, so. Oh, too much conversation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Stream is up. Stream is down. I think it's okay at this end. Sometimes you work until you get a headache and chest pain. No, I don't. I don't. I don't have any pain here. I'm sorry. Masters don't move their blocks. In the old days, the really, really highly skilled carvers moved the blocks as minim as minimal amount as possible. I move much more than they did. All the carvers now, Mano, my friend Asuka-san too, we move our blocks much more than the guys did in the old days. Theoretically, the top guns move their blocks maybe 20 degrees, 20 degrees, and would not rotate them all the way around. These days we do. Yeah, and it's a question of training. I don't, I don't want to start it now, it's too late to start the full explanation now. A block that is carved by a man who didn't rotate it very much and who carved in the classical traditional style. A block carved that way is much easier to print in terms of getting thin lines and much more clear definition. So the general consensus among the people who still know something about this is that the very top guns, not all the lower level carvers at all, the very top guns at the very top level of work probably didn't move their blocks very much. And one of the blocks I've got left over to me from the Taisho, late Meiji or early Taisho era, is carved that way. You can clearly see the guy hasn't moved it and the angles of all the lines show that it wasn't moved. And such a block is much, much easier to print and lasts a much longer time. None of us now have that flexibility. We all grew up moving it around a bit more and a bit more. And when I learned, I didn't know anything about this, I rotated the block all the time. So I'm not a master top gun at this, you know. Anyway, it's, it's a longer story to explain what, about all the angles, and there's just no time for it now. If you trigger me again on this when we have more time to talk about it, we can uh, we can explain more about that. I don't think it's a question of being lazy. It's much more difficult to carve without moving the block, and it would have been a question of discipline. They knew it was better to do it that way so they disciplined themselves to do it that way. For me, the first 10, 15 years I carved with no knowledge or discipline, I just carved in the way that I thought made sense. And if I had known then what I know now, if I was only 20 years old or 15 years old now, I would love to discipline myself to do it that way. I could add that to my YouTube documentary. Whatever, it's in our list of things to talk about on our YouTube somewhere coming up and down. Anyway, here we are. It's 9.25. It's time for me to help Kawaii-san get the shop ready up for business this morning. We got a bit of work done today, not a whole lot. I'm sorry. I probably spent too much time looking at the chat window here than I should have done. Okay, today is a Sunday. We'll have one more day. Ah, tomorrow, I think. I'm not quite sure yet. I think I'll be upstairs tomorrow for a sizing stream. There's a bunch of entries on the DOSA calendar, the sizing calendar. The staff needs paper by about Wednesday or so. And I have other plans for Tuesday. So I think tomorrow's stream might be a sizing stream tomorrow. And it's going to be fun because Aoyama-san has been trying to think about a way to help me. It's been too cold in that room. The size has been congealing at the moment that I brushed it across the paper. And he's prepared a hot tablet for me up there. And it'll be a, a change. We'll try and see how it goes. So there we are. Tomorrow, we'll be back here. Same time, same station. I'll probably be upstairs. I may be down here. I'm not quite sure. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks very much. See you again. More sizing tips. Congealed size. Yes. It's probably a sizing stream tomorrow. We'll see. Okay, away we go. Stop streaming. Thanks again, guys. See you tomorrow.